Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Shaheen Gadir with the Fertile Life Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I have a wonderful, dear old friend of mine, the egg whisperer herself, Dr. Amy Avazadeh. Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Shaheen, for having me. I'm going to rebrand myself as the egg shouter. I'm no longer whispering <laughs> anymore. I'm over 45 now, and I'm here to shout to women to get their levels checked. And, and now we're going to talk about all of that stuff tonight. We're going to shout together. Okay. <laughs> so we are going to shout together. Um, I want to let everyone know that uh, Dr. Amy is a dear friend of mine. Years ago, when I was in my fellowship training, I had the pleasure of having our little young Dr. Amy as my uh, I, I, her, as my student. And we had so much fun together. Um, we were at UCLA and at Cedars when she did a rotation with us there. And it was a pleasure having her there. I could tell that she was going to be a big star um, in our community. And just what I was thinking has happened. She's a lovely, fantastic, well-loved doctor. And one of the things I absolutely love about having other fertility specialists on the podcast is we get to kind of compare, we get to discuss like, what do we do? What do you do? I just, it's a very interesting thing. And I think for patients listening and hearing more than one perspective, um, you we're definitely going to be agreeing on some things. We're definitely going to have our own perspective on things. Amy, kind of tell everyone right now where your clinic is and what you're doing. I am so proud of you for everything that you have done. Um, and I'm really excited for our talk today. Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm here in San Francisco, um, not that far from you. Uh, and I'm baby making. I've been doing it now for almost 15 years. And I'm all about education and making sure people know the simple tests that they can do. And you've probably heard of my tushy method, my balls method, my sparkle method, my angel method, my hope syndrome, my embryo diamonds. I mean, I have all these things to make things super simple for people. And I'm still you know, I'm still basically uh, coming up with new ones. I have a, a fun one coming out soon. I'm not going to, maybe I'll tease it later today, but I well, have another one coming soon. We're definitely talking about tushies and balls and all of those things. Okay. <laughs> because those are, you know, things that excite me a lot. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I love how it just began your career and branded you was becoming the egg whisperer. Um, Amy finished her fertility training a couple of years after I did and uh, moved to Northern California when she has a very successful practice that I'm very proud of her for and really started a movement, a movement that was very much needed in the world of fertility. When egg freezing began and we started to offer it in our clinics, it was a foreign language, something that was kind of not discussed, people were scared of. Tell me what kind of got you going on that idea and make you start wanting to do what you did. I, I'm just so proud of that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I started egg freezing party in 2014 because I was so annoyed that people knew that they could get their boobs done and they didn't know they could get their eggs frozen. Right. I would actually go into elevators and do like, it was almost like my version of survey monkey. I mean, survey monkey wasn't out there in 2004 and I would ask people in an elevator. Cause that's like the stuff that I do. And I'd be like, Hey, does anyone like how many of you here? Cause you got this audience, they're trapped in there with you. They can't go anywhere. And I would say, how many of you guys know that you can freeze your eggs? And maybe like one person would raise their hand and I would be like, I need to change that. Everyone needs to know about egg freezing. Cause if you know about egg freezing, guess what? You know about fertility. You know, and even if you're not going to freeze your eggs, you should at least know what the process is and know what your levels are, at least by the time you're 32, if you think that at some point, maybe you want to have kids. I mean, I have so many golden rules and I can spend all night talking about them, but that's basically where it started. Cause I just got so annoyed that people just didn't know about egg freezing and about the simple tests you can do to get your levels checked, to know about what your fertility levels are and what they say about you. And so I made it fun because Whenever I'm sure you're the same, Shaheen, you go to a party and everyone wants to tell you their fertility story. And they say things like, I know you're not at work, but can I tell you my story? Can you like help my friend, my neighbor? This is what she was doing. And anytime I go to a social gathering, people would like gather around and ask me questions. And it kind of came, became like my own egg freezing party. And that's kind of where the idea came from. And it was just a fun way to socialize with like-minded people, excited. I mean, I, I, it would be weird to to have a fertility doctor say I salivate at the thought of talking about fertility, but I like cry at the thought of like educating people and perhaps preventing someone from crying themselves when they're older, wishing that they had known the things that you and I talk about every day. So that's why I'm kind of 
thinking about egg shouting and egg freezing parties was how it all started. But now you probably notice it too, that most people know that you can freeze their eggs. And so that's- people have fun. learned, thanks to people like yeah, you, thanks yeah, to people and, you. you know, like myself and the yeah. clinics that we have. Um, we, when the egg freezing started to grow and grow, started something called the egg socials, mm -hmm. um, where we just found that it was very reassuring for women to see other women just like themselves in a room having a glass of wine, light little dessert or dinner or something, and talking about a topic that was really not talked about much before. Yeah. And you said 32. I My number is 30, okay? Because I, I know when you say 32, people show up at 35. So I say 30, so people show up at 32. Um, I like to say the younger, the better. It's yeah. almost like pulling teeth, getting someone in their 20s in, but we yeah. sometimes do. So we know we're doing something right and we're on the right path. But I think that the idea that you had of talking about it and saying this and right now, honestly, shouting like we if we shouted this message, we just could not shout it loud enough. Right. And I think that you take all our patients who are over 40 who didn't freeze their eggs, 100 percent of them wish they would have done it when they still had eggs, you know. So, you know, there whenever I talk to a patient that is thinking about it. I just think of all the women that have sat in my office over the age of 40 and they're like, tell her to do it. And of course we're not pushy about it. And we just want to educate people about their levels and what they mean. But, you know, like you said, the younger your eggs are, when you freeze them, the, the, the better chance of pregnancy you're going to have later. I think one of the saddest thing that happened in our industry um, a while back is that you would have a celebrity that would suddenly have twins at the age of like 49 and then everyone's like, well, then if she can do that, then I'll do that later. No one's ever talking about where those eggs came from. Um, no one ever talked about um, what's going on in terms of the entire process of having twins at the age of 49 and everything that's wrong with that. But those things really set us back, I think, in our industry and in our field of medicine, because we are there trying to teach people the importance of everything that we are wanting people to learn and do. And then we have the messages and thank God that has changed. Thank God for all of the celebrities that, and people that have a voice that have talked about their journeys, about how difficult, about how it takes a village to help you have a baby sometimes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I totally agree. I mean, what I say is actually, um, enough, I had a someone share this quote with me, so I can't say that it's mine. And they said, they may be celebrities, and special, but their ovaries are not that special. They're not like so special because they're celebrity ovaries that they have something that the rest of us don't have, which is the ability to have healthy eggs at 50, right? right. And so that, you know, I was like, oh yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it because you're right. I mean, like when Janet Jackson had a baby, people were calling me and said, I want you to do what, you know, Jan you know, Dr. Amy, like, I know you're just as good of a doctor as Janet Jackson's doctor, and you can help me have a baby at 50. And I'm like, I can, but it's not the way you actually think. And so um, I have a website, it's actually menopausalpregnancy.com. And it's not to trick people, it's to educate people that this is how you have a baby when you're in menopause. And the word menopause is not a dirty word and it starts at 40. And I think we have to like normalize aging. Being 40 doesn't mean that you're old, but ovarian aging is a very real thing that people just need to embrace and understand. Right, and it affects everyone, whether mm -hmm. you're a celebrity or not, your yeah. ovaries will age. Maybe some celebrities look better and have better dermatologists to keep those wrinkles away. Um, but unfortunately you can't do much inside of the body. Maybe, so, they're, maybe they're putting Botox in their ovaries and we just don't know it. You know what? Maybe I'm going to ask a couple of my friends a question. Um, <laughs> I've heard of scrotox, but not <laughs> ovary talk. Thank God we're not urologists and we're definitely not talking about that today, but mm -hmm. thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> oh, I have more. We can talk about testicle tanning if you want. Uh, that's one that doesn't interest me that much either, but let's get back to our favorite topic, egg freezing. Um, so tell me one of the, you know, in a nutshell, explain how you handle like your first call or visit with a patient and then how you follow up with it. Yeah. First call is, um, when do you think you're going to have your first baby? Uh, how old are you going to be when you have your last baby? And then I always want to know what their um, relationship status is. 
and if they would consider having a baby as an independent mother in the next five years. So I feel like by asking those questions, I get to know someone really well, and then I can then guide them based on their age and their hormone levels, what the best fertility plan would be for them, whether they should freeze eggs, freeze eggs, freeze embryos, meaning do multiple cycles, or they, and then based on their levels, maybe do half and half. So it just kind of all depends on their answers. That's great. And you know what, just when I thought I was doing it perfectly, I don't ask some of those questions. So I like to ask the question, how many kids do you want to have? Because if you suddenly tell me you want to have four kids and we get like six eggs, well then, you know, we need to have a discussion about that. And if you are coming to freeze your eggs and you're, or just talking about the idea and you're 38 years old and you want to have four kids, you know, we got to have a significant discussion there. So having, asking that question of how many number of kids has been a big one for me. Um, relationship status, I think is interesting. I like to ask, uh, today I had a patient and she's like, yes, my boyfriend and I, we want to make embryos. So I said, so are you and your boyfriend 99.9% .9 having kids with each other in the future? And she said, yes. I said, well, is it 100%? And she said, no, it's 99.99%. .99 I said, then first you need to freeze your eggs mm -hmm. because that, let's do the math, 0.001% chance that, or point, I'm not going to do it, but that be, tiny don't chance. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's yes. the thing. And, yeah. and I've had that happen. Mm -hmm. And I've had that happen even with people that were in, in marriages, unfortunately, and they fell apart and like, I wish I had eggs of my own. So I think for many people, it's really important then they understand that the freezing of the eggs for themselves is first. And then the freezing of the embryos for the couple together is second. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you a question, because this is becoming a big thing. We used to have people that froze their eggs once and we never saw them again. But now our clinic has put together a two cycle egg freezing package and a three cycle egg freezing package. I had one patient of mine do five cycles of egg freezing. So mm -hmm. what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I've had one patient that's done eight cycles of egg freezing to get 11 eggs. She started at the age of 29. Her AMH was 0.1. By the time we were done, her AMH was like 0 0.03 FSH of 40. So, you know, I caught her as she was transitioning through DOR to primary ovarian insufficiency. And I fought for every single egg that I got for her. So, I mean, wow. everyone's different. So yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of like, your age, how many children you want, just like the question you ask, and then how many cycles of eggs is it going to take? Um, Amy, do you have a cutoff on women that you freeze their eggs for? Um, how about I'll answer it this way. The oldest patients, and this is a true story, and she has allowed me to share this publicly. I can't say her name. The oldest patient's egg that I've frozen was 52. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that just tells you, I don't have a cutoff because we don't tell men no. Right. So we don't tell a 52 year old man, I'm not going to freeze your sperm. So that's a gender gap. And while I know the biology tells us that that egg has a 0.0000000000000001% chance of working. She wanted a chance. She's smart. She knows it's probably and not going to work. I'm not giving her false hope. So I gave her that chance. I love that. And I do the same. So I, educate my patient that their chance of it working is extremely, extremely low. But I learned very early in my career that you cannot cut off people's hope. Mm -hmm. Now, years ago, one of my patients, when she graduated from my office, I got a gift in the mail and it was a name plaque and it said on it, um, Dr. Shaheen Gadir, ambassador of hope. And oh, I loved it. I put it right in my office and I look at it every day. Oh. The last thing you can tell someone as a fertility specialist which is a very unique field of medicine. And we're both so blessed for being in this field that you can't cut off someone's hope. And whether it means that you have an egg or two sitting there that may never get you to that point, which is no one's goal, but you never know. I do believe in miracles. I tell people all the time, I've had people freeze 30 eggs and we didn't get a kid out of it. I had a patient of mine that once had two eggs she got two genetically normal embryos and she had two kids from it. This mm -hmm. one, I will never forget. Mm -hmm. Her positivity went so far. And I love this woman for what she taught me mm -hmm. because I always learn so much from my patients. And I feel that giving hope to people and being that ambassador of hope for every single person that walks on the door is such an important thing to do. Yeah, we're hope dealers, Shaheen. 
that's what someone called me. And I don't know that she was saying it as a compliment. <laughs> you know what? That's a good one. I, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I'll take it. <laughs> but I'm not sure you meant that kindly. You know, but I yeah, gotta, I mean, hope to me means having only positive and practical expectations. That's right. what And I think as a physician, if you educate people in the practical, real way, you give them the opportunity to make their own decision if they're willing to take that sacrifice of the financial, the emotional, and the couple of weeks of injections that it takes to get what they can get. And I think it's really important to give people that opportunity, a very important to give people that opportunity. So I love that you think that way, because I really agree with that. And I think giving people hope and doing what they, and you never know when it's going to work. So, and, and to be honest, maybe science will come out with something in the future that says, as long as you have an egg, we can do something to it that makes it more functional and also work well and be natural and do really, really well. So mm -hmm. those are, are, are great, great thoughts. So what's coming on the horizon for you? I want you to touch base about a couple of your different theories though. Like let's talk about the tushy. Yeah, so Tushy Method are the five steps that every fertility patient or anyone who wants to know about their fertility, the five steps or tests that they should do in order to learn more about their bodies. Tubes, uterus, sperm, hormones, your genetics. Those are the five things, right? Like it shouldn't be that complicated. You and I see these patients all the time that come in and be, and they're like, I have unexplained infertility and they haven't even had the T or the S or the H, you know what I mean? They've just been labeled that way. And, and I just came up with this mnemonic to make it easy for people to get their fertility checked. That is a good one. I used to be called in med school, the pneumotic King, and I didn't think of a tushy method. So I'm feeling like a loser right now. Okay. But let's go on to the next one. <laughs> Falls method is for the guys. So if you have low sperm, it's not one of those things where you just go do IVF. No, you got to take care of your balls. Background genetics, like your Y chromosome microdeletion, chromosome analysis, DNA fragmentation, A is anatomy for the varicocele check, labs for your testosterone level and hormones like that, lifestyle, put down the joint, please. And then sex, talking about what's going on in the bedroom and think about supplements. So that's the balls method. Gosh, love that one too. So good. <laughs> Tushies and balls all the way. <laughs> all Let's go on. I'm now I'm on a roll and I need to know okay. all of these. Okay. So then I have the egg whisper diet, my recipe for IVF success. And success doesn't necessarily mean having it work. Success means like you did your very best. So diagnosis, right? As part of planning your IVF cycle, embryo transfer preparation, and then your transfer. Each of them is a stage and you take it one step at a time so that once you're at your transfer, no matter if it worked or not, you're never going to wish that you had done something better or different. You're going to have done all of those things ahead of time. Gosh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Are there any more tricks up your sleeve? Oh, I got a ton more. You want more? I'll yes. give you more. Yes. Okay, I want fertility more. team. Team is the most important thing that you need to build before you start your cycle. So that's therapy exercise, acupuncture, mindfulness, and meditation. So I tell everyone to build their team from the very beginning. You don't want to start talking to a therapist after you have PTSD, after the fertility shittery, after you've been fertility bitch slapped over and over and have whiplash. No, you want to build your team from the very beginning to talk to someone throughout your journey. I love that one. And we're going to talk about that now for a sec, because I really love that idea. I think your support system in the process of freezing your eggs and also in the entire fertility journey is so incredibly important. Um, I think having people that are supportive that you can talk to that are there for you in that process is so important. So once in a while, I used to see two friends would come in together and want to freeze their eggs. So my clinic has started something that I highly encourage you do as well. If you like the idea, we have a friends that freeze their eggs together, get discounts together. So we have a discount. If two people come in together to do it, they both get, I think it's 25% off. And if three people come together, they get 30% off because we realize that when friends do this together, it improves the process for them so much that that's something that I really loved. Um, sometimes people feel awkward going to a therapist to discuss. If I had time, I talked to a therapist every single day. I think it's an amazing thing to be able to do where a professional person who guides you through difficult aspects in your life is there for you. But let's go down. What was, what else was part of the teams? Uh, therapy, exercise, acupuncture, mindfulness, and meditation. Exercise. Love yeah. that. I don't know if you 
follow my social media, but I have made a, a one-time exercise video. I, <laughs> I have to find it. Do not laugh, do, please. Of course I, follow. I did I with the founder of Natural Pilates, who is a dear friend of mine here in Los Angeles, on one of the rooftops here in LA. Um, we did a Pilates uh, modified, people ask me, what can I do? What can I, you know? So we just did it to like up to day X of stimulation. You can do this up to day this of that. You can do that. And you see me in exercise gear, actually doing the exercises, the best part of the entire video. I don't know where it's lost in the entire world of social media, but it's somewhere out there. Um, so exercise, incredibly, incredibly important. Um, acupuncture, love. Yeah, I've done acupuncture myself. Me too. And I used to think it was like something awkward and weird. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. And I really believe in it. Tell me your thoughts. Oh, I totally agree. I think it helps with the experience. It's another person on your team, someone who's going to listen to you and guide you and be there for you. I think patients that do it have less depression and they also have less side effects, less nausea. They sleep better. Like that's all good. Does it really improve that quality? I don't know about that. Does it thicken the lining of the uterus? Probably not, but I think all the other benefits really just help with the experience. And I think that's what we need right now. It's hard not to be anxious and worried all the time right now with what's going on in the world. So something like going to an acupuncturist can kind of decrease someone's anxiety. It's just like a win-win for all of us. Yeah, I have to agree. I love acupuncture and I'm not sure what the science behind it is exactly. I, I do believe it probably does incre increase blood flow to certain organs and that could be beneficial. Um, I'm not sure if it actually changes statistics of pregnancy, but studies do show here and there that it does. But I do believe that another supportive human being in the process, and we have now acupuncture in-house. So it's huge. We adore our in-house acupuncturist. And I still have a few acupuncturists in town that I refer to that I absolutely think are amazing or people that I've went to myself. Um, I think the resetting of your mind and you get up and you're just like fresh and brand new and relaxed is huge. And I think during this entire process, that is a big, 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 big part of the whole fertility treatment process of just being refreshed and refined. Um, so I, I agree with you. And I think acupuncture is wonderful there. Yeah. And the last one that you said was, was it meditation and mindfulness? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Meditation and mindfulness. So have a mantra from the very beginning, like have that happy place and be able to go to it immediately. You're getting your blood drawn, find your place. And I joke with my patients a lot, if you can't tell, and I tell them, if you can't figure out what to do, just squeeze your buns, just squeeze them. <laughs> Because well, if you squeeze your butt cheeks together, guess what? You're not thinking about anything else. You're just thinking about like not farting. That is a great idea. Is, but yeah. I think the whole mindfulness is so, so incredibly important in this entire process. Um, I'm so glad that you address it because I address it all the time. I make sure that my staff addresses it. I make sure that my staff and myself address the patient's well-being. And if my nurses see that someone is not feeling great, and it's kind of losing it. The first thing they know to do is tell me that I need to call them. And that's something that we go out of our way to do. And I'm sure that you take amazing care of your patients as well. I try. I try. This has been so much fun catching up and doing a podcast together. This was like a phone call that I've owed in a long time. <laughs> and I'm so glad that everyone gets to listen to our catch up phone call that it would have been a lot of fun if we did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And I'm so honored that you joined me on the Fertile Life podcast and today. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, for all of you guys listening, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Amy, for joining me on another episode of the Fertile Life podcast. Thank you, everyone, and take care. Mm -hmm.